So thanks so much for uh, joining this session. Um, today, I'd like to share a little bit about cloud bursting definition and use cases and why and how it could be useful to you and show you a demo of a basic cloud bursting use case scenario and talk about the current limitations, a few takeaways and references. Cloud bursting is defined as your control plane running on cloud provider A. It could be on-premise data center, AWS, Azure, or GCP. And a subset of the pods that are reporting to your control plane are running on a cloud provider that's different from cloud provider A. So your control plane could be on on-premise data center and your uh, some of your pods could be running on uh, AWS, for example. Why would you need a scenario like that? Why would you need some of the pods being scheduled on a different cloud provider than the control plane? Um, I'd like to share three main use cases where this could be an interesting way of scheduling your pods. The first one is a bursting during peak workload. So let's take an example where you have all of your uh, Kubernetes clusters on an on-premise data center and uh, you have your Kubernetes master, you have uh, 10 worker nodes re reporting to your Kubernetes master and you have estimated that you are running uh, at peak capacity, you're going to run 1,000 pods and uh, you've done pretty good capacity planning and your 10 worker nodes are running at 90 to 100% capacity with respect to CPU and memory for your 1,000 uh, 1, pods. And uh, let's say Black Friday comes along and your peak capacity need suddenly goes up from being able to run 1,000 pods to 2,000 pods. Now, there is no capacity on your on-premise data center amongst your 10 worker nodes to run these 1,000 extra pods. So it would be really nice to be able to ship pod 1,001 up to 2,000 to, say, AWS or Azure during back Black Friday uh, peak workload. And once your regular operations return after Black Friday is over with, you have enough capacity to run your thousand pods on your 10 worker nodes. So this is one scenario where you it would be nice to be able to burst to a different cloud provider if you're running on on-premise data center to be able to handle capacity needs during unexpected peaks in workload spikes. The second use case is disaster recovery. Let's say you have your Kubernetes cluster running on AWS, you have your master and you have 10 worker nodes and you have a couple of pods that are backing a critical business critical service and um, your business critical service has high SLAs and it needs to be up no matter what. Um, if the cluster is going to crash, whether it's because of the cloud provider issue or because of a node crash or Kubernetes master crash, it would be super important for your business critical services for the services to be always be able to be up. So if you have a DR pod that's running on a different cloud provider, let's say Azure, and the DR pod is still reporting to the same ELB service, if a crash happens on AWS, your business critical service is still going to have zero downtime so that your SLAs are honored. So this is the second use case where being able to burst to a different cloud provider would be super helpful. And the third use case is the ability to stretch your Kubernetes cluster compute across multiple cloud providers. Um, for example, AWS and Azure and on-premise data centers might have compute at various price points. So it would be nice to be able to schedule certain pods that are not super business critical, like your test pods, et cetera, on a cloud provider where the current price is lower that compared to the other cloud providers and your super critical important pods to be scheduled on a cloud provider where the where you get the best SLA when compared to the other cloud providers. And it would be super burdensome on the DevOps teams to have a proliferation of control planes to be able to maintain these various pods across various cloud providers. And also different cloud providers will bring better, cheaper instances and launch types to market at very high cadence. So instead of focusing on your core business, you'll end up hand curating compute across various cloud providers um, 
uh, in order to be able to schedule their applications and uh, hand curating these plethora of multiple hundreds of control planes. So it would be nice to have just one control plane or multiple control planes and uh, be able to schedule your pods across various cl uh, cloud providers. Uh, let me quickly check the chat to see if there was something important. Awesome, it's uh, for the previous uh, talk. So let's go ahead. So now that we've looked at these three key use cases for uh, cloud bursting needs, uh, what are a couple of ways in which we can achieve cloud bursting? Um, one way is to use nodeless Kubernetes. Nodeless Kubernetes presents a virtual worker node to the control plane. The virtual worker node runs two open source projects, virtual kubelet and a cloud instance provider that works under virtual kubelet. What the virtual worker node does is it advertises a very large capacity to the control plane. Whereas in actuality, it's running on very, it's consuming very small capacity. Um, when a pod comes in to the control plane um, and it says that, hey, I have an affinity to run on the virtual worker node, the control plane will ship the pod over to the virtual worker node. The virtual worker node is configured with the cloud provider of choice that you would want to schedule all of these bursty workloads to. So let's say your control plane is running on on-premise data center and the virtual worker node is configured to ship pods to AWS. So if a pod comes in to, uh, to be scheduled on the control plane, the control plane will schedule the pod to the virtual worker node because it's advertising very large capacity. And the virtual worker node can ship the pod over to a spot instance or an on-demand instance or a Fargate or an AC, uh, Fargate launch type on, on AWS, depending on the pods SLAs and the um, affinity that you asked for your pod for a certain compute launch type. As long as the pod is running to the control plane, it appears that the pod is running on the virtual worker node. And once the pod terminates, the underlying compute launch type is automatically terminated by the virtual worker node. Um, so let's go ahead and see what happens under the covers with the virtual worker node. The virtual worker node is not a physical worker node that's running a regular kubelet. It's actually a simple pod that runs two components. Uh, one is virtual kubelet, with, which implements a subset of the kubelet API calls, and the cloud instance provider, which makes intelligence decisions on the kind of compute launch types to schedule each and every pod on. Um, and this pod can run on any of the existing uh, worker nodes, so you don't have to you don't have to provision a separate worker node to run your virtual worker component. So the virtual kubelet and uh, KIP, which stands for Cloud Instance Provider for Kubernetes, they advertise to the API server on your master node saying that, hey, I'm a worker node and I have this very large capacity. And the amount of capacity that you advertise to the control plane is configurable through a config map. So you can set limits on how much you want to burst capacity uh, to the external cl cloud provider for your, um, for your overflow pods. So let's go ahead and see how this actually works. Um, so in the demo, I have Minikube running on my MacBook and uh, Minikube is using HyperKit on the MacBook and I have Kubernetes master and the virtual worker node uh, that is set up on the Minikube. And I will create an Nginx deployment with one replica. So the Nginx pod will be shipped off to AWS. I will then scale the replica for the Nginx deployment from one one to three pods. So the automatic scaling of the uh, replica set from one to three should go to AWS as well. And after that, I will delete Nginx deployment, which should, uh, which should reduce the footprint on AWS from three replicas back to zero. So I will be back to running everything on the Minikube on my MacBook. Let's check the status of Minikube. So everything is up and running. 
So if I look at the nodes that are in my Kubernetes uh, system, I have a master and I have this virtual kubelet worker node. Like I mentioned earlier, this virtual kubelet worker node is actually a system pod. Um, so if I do a get pods, In Cube system, I see this virtual kubelet pod that's running. So the worker node for virtual kubelet is actually, it's simply a pod that's saying that, hey, control plane, I am a worker node and I have this capacity. So let's see how much capacity the uh, virtual worker node has. So it's advertising a capacity of 20 vCPUs and 512 gigs of RAM and a pod limit of 200. This is actually configurable through a config map setting for the virtual, virtual worker nodes um, pod that's running. So let me show you how that's... Uh, so this is the config map that the virtual kubelet pod is given. And in this config map, we set the uh, CPU and memory limits on how much capacity, what's the uh, high watermark of the capacity that you want the virtual worker node to be able to schedule pods to. So um, now that I have this up and running, I, I would like to create the Nginx deployment. So this deployment has um, Nginx deployment as the name, and I would like one replica, and I want to set a label of app set to Nginx. And I'm also uh, asking for resource requests of one vCPU, one vCPU and, uh, hold on for a second, and uh, two gigs of RAM. So let's make sure that there are no deployments currently. And I will create the Nginx deployment. So what's happening under the covers is that um, the Nginx deployment was sent to the control plane and the control plane sees the virtual worker node which has 20, v, uh, 20 vCPUs, 512 gigs of RAM and 200 pod limit with the virtual worker node. So it thinks that, hey, this virtual worker node has enough capacity to schedule the one vCPU and two gigs of RAM worth of one replica of Nginx. So it will schedule the Nginx pod to the virtual worker node. The virtual worker node is configured uh, to ship pods over to AWS. And uh, the virtual worker node will look at the resource requirements for the Nginx pod, which is one vCPU and two gigs of RAM. And it will create just-in-time right-sized compute launch type on AWS to run the one replica of the, um, of the Nginx pod. So let's see if the Nginx deployment is currently up and running. So let's look at this deployment on um, EC2 console. So if we look at this replica, it's running on a T3 small instance type, which is the right sized instance type for the um, for running the uh, replica for the Nginx pod. And um, let's now try to scale the deployment from one replica to up to three replicas. And let me see if there is any question out here on chat. So Girish uh, asks if we can control the scheduling like only when the on-premise is out of resources, then only run the pod in the cloud. Uh, yes, you will be able to control scheduling for when you're out of resources on on-premise data center. That is when you would want to uh, ship pods to the virtual worker node. So the virtual worker node has a taint associated with it. So they, we can make scheduling decisions to only schedule your pods to the tainted node if there is um, if if the capacity on the rest of the worker nodes is running out so only um, have a toleration for the taint if the capacity on the rest of the worker nodes is out so i hope that answers the question 
And Girish, please uh, ping again on, on the chat if, uh, if it doesn't answer the question. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, try to scale the deployment from one replica up to three replicas. So let me do... Um, The, the deployment has been scaled. So now we should see all the uh, the two new replicas being scheduled to AWS as well. So the nice thing about bursting using virtual worker node is that you're no longer limited by the capacity of the um, of the each single worker node on your regular um, on-premise data center. So the burst uh, capacity provisioning happens in parallel. So if you would need to say scale from 1000 pods to 2000 pods as in uh, the first use case that I mentioned, which is the Black Friday use case, if you need to uh, provision 1000 new pods on um, AWS, the provisioning happens in parallel. So your reaction time to unexpected spikes in your workload is pretty quick because provision is going to happen in parallel. So let's go back to the um, to the scale up use case. So we see that all three uh, replicas are now up and running. So let's verify on the EC2 console that that the new replica is actually up and running. So uh, Richard asks, um, what's a good way to move parts back from virtual worker node if the main nodes become less busy? Um, that's a really good question. So um, what the way that we would recommend to, uh, to scale up and scale down is actually to use the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, so if you let horizontal pod autoscaler make the choice as to how many replicas each deployment needs based on the current workload pattern, when you do the scale down, um, we can assign an affinity for uh, keeping the pods on the on-premise data center up and uh, scaling down the pods on the uh, AWS first uh, when we react to the horizontal pod autoscaler scaling down decision. So, um, so we could always assign lowest priority for scheduling to the virtual worker node that has the taint so that the scale up and scale down decisions are always um, have a strong preference for the regular worker nodes and lower preference, lower priority for the virtual worker node. Um, if you'd actually like a uh, recorded demo of how that would uh, work out, I'd happy to make a recording with um, a horizontal pod autoscaler and share it with you all. So please let me know if that would be useful either on the Q&A or on Slack. Thanks so much. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we have the, the new pods that are scheduled. One thing I missed mentioning is that all of the applications labels automatically translate to key value pairs for tags for the newly provisioned um, instances, cloud compute instances, um, so that you can, um, you can execute governance rules, things like that, to make sure that your costs are all still according to the budget budget requirements. So let's go ahead and uh, delete the deployment now. So if I do the deletion of the deployment of um, Nginx. So once the uh, underlying pods are terminated, um, the compute instances that were spawned just in time on the cloud provider are automatically terminated as well. So you see that uh, the, the instance backing the replicas are being shut down. So once your workload um, burst has ended, the capacity that's being consumed on the external cloud provider is going to go down as well. Um, Rene and 
Martin have related questions, which is network bridging. For the first version of uh, cloud bursting, we actually rely on uh, VPC that is uh, that the cloud providers offer or you set up yourself. Um, one of the references is actually a demo of, um, let me open this up. So one of the um, demo uh, deployments that we offer for the, with both the open source projects is uh, setting up a test bed environment for uh, with VPN and without VPN. So if you want to bring your own VPN connectivity, uh, that should work. Uh, or if you'd like to provision a cluster that is stretched with uh, the cloud provider's VPN, that should work as well. Um, Beyond that, if you have specific ingress requirements for your ports and SLAs for your services, for your network connectivity, um, we'd love to hear more on the specific requirements so that uh, we can put together reference architectures for reference architecture that actually meets the requirements that you have. Uh, all right, so what's a good way to move pods? Main note, yes, so um, as mentioned earlier, if we are reacting to the HPA's decision to scale back, we can assign lower priority to the uh, virtual worker node that has the taint associated with it saying that it's a virtual worker node so that you are only scheduling pods to it if the rest of the worker nodes are out of capacity and you are selecting pods for termination from the worker node first before you uh, terminate pods from the regular worker nodes if HPA decides to scale down. Um, if uh, if there's enough interest, I'd, I'd love to put together a recorded demo of how the HPA interaction would work and with this preferential treatment between the virtual worker node and the regular worker node. Uh, thanks so much. Awesome. Um, so let's move on to some of the caveats of uh, of cloud bursting with the technology that exists as of today. Um, there's still a couple of uh, features that we are working on. It's work in progress, which is persistent volume support and daemon set support. Um, currently, you can only burst a non um, a non stateful app, so it so it only works for stateless applications. And daemon sets actually uh, the intent behind a daemon set uh, translates to the functionality of a sidecar in a nodeless world because each pod gets its own compute launch type. So um, if you want a daemon set that's running on your regular worker node to work as designed on um, a pod that is scheduled via virtual worker node, the daemon set um, uh, process needs to actually run as a sidecar on the virtual worker node, on the uh, compute launch types that's backing your pod for your nodeless pod. So, um, so that is something that's work in progress. Um, with respect to cloud providers, uh, node, uh, cloud bursting with nodeless is GA on AWS and beta on Azure and GCP is work in progress as well. So we'd love to hear more on if you have specific needs for cloud bursting to a different cloud provider, uh, we'd love to hear more about it. Uh, by the way, all of the technologies that have been used in the demo are 100% open source. So there's nothing proprietary involved um, in giving this a try. So a couple of takeaways. Um, Multi-cloud use cases cannot be addressed by the traditional tight coupling of pods to pet compute worker nodes uh, because you are basically relying on, on a lot of uh, assumptions on the pet worker nodes for the pods to be running on them. Um, in the traditional uh, single uh, uh, single siloed cloud vendor uh, use case. So with respect to cloud bursting use cases, the traditional tight coupling is not going to work. Um, Nodeless via virtual kubelet and KIP decouples the pod compute from your worker node. So the flexibility that comes with it is a great fit for cloud bursting use cases, including the burst capacity planning, which was the first use case and the, what the demo addressed uh, to be with and disaster recovery and stretch cloud uh, scenarios.
Awesome. Um, so if you'd like to try Virtual Kubelet and KIP for cloud bursting without VPN and with, with VPN, here are the GitHub links. I will share the slide deck on um, Virtual Rejects Slack right after this um, talk. Um, and uh, Virtual Kubelet and KIP, as I mentioned earlier, are both open source projects. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, please feel free to to file issues or talk to us on Virtual Kubelet Slack, on Q, uh, Virtual Kubelet's channel on Kubernetes Slack. And if you'd like to read more about Nodeless Kubernetes in general and check out other use cases for Nodeless, um, other use cases for Nodeless, uh, feel free to check out uh, Elotl's blogs on Medium. If you have questions or comments, uh, please write to us, uh, file issues on KIP, or like I mentioned earlier, talk to us on Virtual Kubelet channel on Kubernetes Slack. Uh, let's see, there's one more question. All right, I'm unable to see the question. So um, thanks so much to Brendan, Wilmosh, and John from Elotal Engineering who built a uh, KIP and Virtual Kubelet integration. Ria and Brian from Virtual Kubelet team for building a fantastic uh, product that enabled uh, this newer use cases in the multi-cloud scenarios. And uh, Rejects organizers for hanging in there and moving Rejects to online. It's great to be able to talk to the rest of the community. And thanks so much for for listening to what we had to share and um, asking interesting questions. And feel free to follow up on Slack or uh, reject Slack or on the virtual uh, Kubelet Slack if you have any other questions as well. Thank you.